In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the cell membrane. So before we begin, if you could please make eight boxes. Now, when we look at the cell membrane, the key, I mean, the main part of the cell membrane is that it separates the cell. So if here's the cell, here's the outside from the inside of the cell. Now, the cell membrane um, also has to be responsible for what enters and leaves the cell. So it will allow some substances to cross um, through the membrane a little bit more easily than others. So when we look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane is said to be, if we go back, selectively or semi-permeable. Now when we see this, what that means is small nonpolar stuff like oxygen or carbon dioxide can go right through the membrane no problem. Whereas ions or charged molecules can't. Sometimes large things can't cross through either. So we'll eventually see in this uh, chapter why ions can't cross the membrane while oxygen can. But regardless of the why, the cell membrane is selectively permeable. Some things can cross through and others can't. S similar to like a colander that you might cook with if you're going to you know, boil some noodles and want to drain the water, the water can go through, but the noodles can't. It's semi-permeable. Or a screen on a window it lets air and small particles through, like dust or pollen, uh, whereas large things like leaves or insects can't cross through the membrane. So it's selectively permeable. If you had a big volleyball net and you want to throw a bunch of balls at it, uh, basketball, ping pong balls, sorry, the basketball wouldn't fit through, uh, but maybe a ping pong ball, a marble, or a BB would. So you can see where the larger objects are kept on one side, where the smaller objects can go through. So this net would be semi-permeable, just like the cell membrane. So in your first box, if you'd like to write down what semi-permeable means. Now the cell membrane is made out of a couple different kinds of macromolecules. The cell membrane is made out of phospholipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. You can see it looks like a mosaic of stuff. So when we look at phospholipids in a bit more detail, the phospholipids really have two parts. Um, and what they're made out of is a glycerol molecule. So right here is our glycerol with three carbons like we saw in our triglycerides. It has fatty acids, but instead of having three fatty acids, a phospholipid only has two. But now it also has a phosphate group. So right here it has a phosphate group as it's, um, we call it the head region of the phospholipid. Now this here is negatively charged. You can see that negative charge, that's significant when it comes to the um, structure of that cell membrane. So when I look at this cell membrane, oops, um, what I see is that the, um, oops, here we go, sorry. When I look at the phospholipid, I can see the phospholipid head has a negative charge, and it has fatty acid lipid tails. Now, these tails are made out of carbons and hydrogens, just like our other fatty acids. Well, fatty acids, we learned in our previous unit, that they don't mix with water. Lipids and water don't mix. So here, the top part is polar, while the bottom part, the fatty acids, are nonpolar. This region does not like water. Um, up here, because water is a polar molecule, the phospholipid head um, is attracted to water. So when we look at this, we can see here this negative charge. Is this going to be polar or nonpolar? Turns out it's polar. And then this region of the phospholipid, the phosphate group head, so this part here, loves water. Whereas the two fatty acid tails are made of hydrocarbons, and they are actually nonpolar. And they're nonpolar because the charge is all evenly distributed throughout these uh, fatty acid tails. So do they love water? No, they're actually fearful of water. So what we get is a phospholipid that has two parts. It has a part that loves water, that's polar, and a part that fears water, and it's nonpolar. So you can see here, think about the structure of a phospholipid, and then go ahead and draw a phospholipid. 
in your box two with the polar and nonpolar regions labeled. Now when we look at phospholipids, are they hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Now fatty acid tails are hydrophobic or water fearing, whereas um, so hydrophobic, think of a phobia of water, whereas the um, phosphate group head is hydrophilic or water loving. So this word right here, hydrophilic, means water loving, <laughs> um, and the phobic means fearing. This gives the molecule what's called a dual personality. And so the fact that it has a dual personality and has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, this molecule is said to be amphipathic. Think of like an amphibian that lives part on land and part on water. Amphipathic. Um, and so the interaction with water is complex and very important when it comes down to our cell membranes. So in your next box, if you could just write what does amphi amphipathic mean and why does it apply to phospholipids? So here I have a cell membrane. Oh, no, just kidding. I have a bunch of lipid phospholipids. And what I see here, um, what happens is our phospholipids actually form a region in the middle here that excludes water. So all cells are surrounded in water. So oh, here's the inside of your cell. And then here's your outside of your cell. So your organelles, so your cell membrane is actually made of two layers of phospholipids. And now the cool thing about phospholipids, if I were to put them into water just like this, they wouldn't be happy because this part hates water. It's hydrophobic. So now if I were to just drop them into water like this, what does this see? So here we have hydrophilic part of the phospholipid. Here we have our hydrophobic part of the phospholipid. So if I were to put these into water, what shape would form, do you think? You're right, it'd be shape B. You could see how all of these area, the phospholipids would try and get away from where there's water. So phospholipids uh, tend to form in a way where they're gonna limit, or like if you see here, the hydrophilic head will touch the water and the hydrophobic tails will repel or try and get away from water. So when we look at the significance of that, here is a cell membrane, and the cell membrane is made out of a double layer of phospholipids. It has what's called a lipid bilayer. So there's an area in the middle where the tails are that repels water or is hydrophobic. Then you have the outer part that loves water. So when we look at this phospholipid bilayer, it's actually pretty much more complicated than um, just lipids, phospholipids. Um, that's what you're seeing here. Here's some proteins. You can see here we have carbohydrates. So there's different parts um, to a cell membrane. But the key part right here is that you have two regions. This region is going to be polar, and so is this region. The phosphate groups are polar hydrophilic or water loving, whereas the middle part is nonpolar or hydrophobic. So our cell membrane ends up having a polar region and a nonpolar region. So here our cell membrane has a nonpolar core and then polar um, phosphate group heads that come into contact with the water. You have water inside the cell and there's water outside the cell. So it makes sense that the polar regions face the outside and face the inside. Now we could also use the words, instead of polar, we can call that area hydrophilic. So we have a hydrophilic region of the cell membrane. And we also have a hydrophobic, water-loving, water-fearing. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> Okay, so now, uh, why is the cell membrane formed into a lipid bilayer? Why is it in two layers? Oops, and then I uh, use the words hydrophobic and hydrophilic in your answer in your box four, please. Now, when we look at why this is important, um, because when we look at our cell membrane, you can see here that the inside is going to have water. Oops, um, you're going to have water. Oops inside of your cell 
And so there'd be wa you'd have water inside your cell as well as outside of your cell. So when you look at this, you have your um, water here as well as here. So you have your polar regions lining the inside and the outside of your cell membranes. Now, cholesterol can also be found in a cell membrane. Now, if you remember cholesterol, it falls into the sterile category, so it is a lipid. So, uh, if I were to try and figure out, well, how does cholesterol fit into the cell membrane? I could have a couple different choices. So think to yourself, which one of these is the accurate picture to show how cholesterol would fit into a cell membrane? If it's a lipid, would you find it on the outside of the cell membrane, or would you find it on the inside? And you're right, you'd find it on the inside because that's where we have the lipids, the fatty acids, or on the middle. So when I look at cholesterol, I can see we have cholesterol placed into the cell membrane um, to kind of act as a regulator on how fluid a cell membrane is. So cholesterol is going to help um, prevent fatty acids from packing too close together, but also helps to kind of act as a rigid, um, like a rigid piece of the cell membrane to prevent it from getting too fluid. So kind of fascinating. This is something that we can talk more about in class. So um, kind of based on my limited explanation, explain what role cholesterol plays in the cell membrane in your box five, please. Now, a cool thing about membranes and the fatty acids is that you have different kinds. You could have unsaturated or you could have saturated fatty acids. And when we look at saturated, we see saturated are going to be very straight chains, remember solid at room temperature, where unsaturated are going to have kinks in them, a little bit more fluid. So when we look at cell membranes, uh, if you have a lot of saturated fatty acids, they're going to be very viscous. Think like very thick syrup or sap on a tree. Whereas something very fluid might be like if you spill your milk and it you know flows across the table. That'd be very fluid. So depending on the fatty acids, are they unsaturated or are they saturated, that's going to help play a role in how fluid or viscous a cell membrane is. So here this would be a very fluid cell membrane. This one would be very viscous and thick. Ooh, and we see here how cholesterol can kind of prevent this from happening. Cholesterol kind of puts like spacers to hold the, um, the fatty acids a little bit apart from each other to prevent a membrane from becoming too thick. So now, how does the composition of the fatty acid influence the fluidity of the cell membrane? Now, the cell membrane is also more than just lipids, though. The cell membrane, you can see, has proteins, uh, it has something called glycoproteins, which is a protein and a carbohydrate. It could have proteins that go across the whole membrane. Um, it has cholesterol as part of it. It has phospholipids. It has proteins that are on the outside of the membrane. It has lipids with carbohydrates attached, called a glycolipid. And when we look at the proteins in our membrane, we have some called peripheral proteins that are going to be found on the outside of membranes. Peripheral, think about your peripheral vision as like your outer vision. You have your integral proteins. They're actually inside of the membrane. That would be these red ones here. So when we look at this, which color are integral proteins and which color are peripheral proteins? Good. Peripheral is going to be the blue ones, and integral is going to be the yellow ones. Now, if you want to make a note in box 7 about integral and peripheral proteins, that'd be awesome. And then last, we want to think about why are proteins a perfect molecule to build structures in the cell membrane? And if you remember our amino acids, we have some that are nonpolar and hydrophobic, and we have some that are polar. Well, this is perfect because now, as that protein folds up, you'll actually find the hydrophobic amino acids in the middle, and then you'll find the polar or hydrophilic amino acids in the, in the polar part of the protein. Awesome.